Hey, it's Seth Levitt from The Fish Tank here on the Five Reasons Sports Network. When I'm not riding OJ's coattails in the tank, I'm, well, riding Jason Taylor's coattails at the Jason Taylor Foundation. And this Monday night, November 5th, we've got one of our most popular fundraising events taking place as the Miami Dolphins legend and first ballot Hall of Famer hosts the 15th annual JT's Ping Pong Smash presented by Publix at the Seminole Hard Rock Event Center in Hollywood. Join JT and some of South Florida's best, including current and former Dolphins players, cheerleaders, local media personalities and more as they team up with generous community members like yourself to play in the original celebrity doubles table tennis tournament yes oj will be there as will ethan skolnick and a number of your favorite five reasons personalities the smash is a great night out for families as it also features interactive games haircuts the best buy fun zone and more so come on out to jt's ping pong smash 15 this monday night november 5th doors open at 5 30 p.m and admission for spectators is just a five dollar donation remember it's at the seminal hard rock event center Center, so park in the Winner's Way Garage. For more information, visit jasontaylorfoundation.org or call 954-424-0799. Welcome into the latest episode of the Five Reasons Podcast. I'm Ethan Skolnick here, as always, with Chris Winningham. Today we are actually on site at Hard Rock Stadium. If you hear a little background noise, we're doing this from a small studio right above the field. A lot of fans are still out there, and they're doing something that the Dolphins did not do on offense today, which is scoring touchdowns. But we're talking <laughs> about a win. It may not sound like it here as we go forward, but first, obviously, I want to tell you about the rest of our network, in addition to our podcast, which you should subscribe to, now that you have found it, so just hit the follow or subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. Make sure you subscribe to the other 13 podcasts in our network. It's not just 12 others now. It's now 13. We introduced today episode zero of our Chamber podcast that is hosted by former Dolphin Chris Chambers, who did used to score touchdowns back in the day, in addition to Shay Tab, who was a Dolphins cheerleader but also has been in the media. You've heard her on radio doing traffic, also on various shows over the past few years, and Zach Duarte, who has hosted shows on 790 The Ticket. The three of them will be doing a fitness performance pod. It'll be coming out every Monday. It'll be a great thing for you to take to the gym after you've procrastinated all weekend. It'll be <laughs> not just about performance of professional and collegiate athletes, which is something that Chris handles uh, quite a bit, getting players ready for the draft, but also we'll have a lifestyle component to it, a nutrition component to it, and we think it's a great addition to our network. Obviously, also check out 3 Yards Per Carry our Dolphins podcast, The Fish Tank with O.J. McDuffie, Miami Heat Beat, Goldie on Ice, Swings and Mishes, and all of our other podcasts. All right, Chris, so what we're going to try to do today is figure out our confusion with the Dolphins. Um, this is one of the worst football games I've ever seen in person. Now, you don't agree with that necessarily. No, I mean, I, I was at both football games this weekend. They were both pretty dreadful. Here's how pretty dread- pretty appalling. Like <laughs> it, sitting in attendance for six plus hours of football and watching the home team score three touchdowns has not been fun. Two offensive touchdowns, um, right? And and not only that, we're going to get on the in, on the Canes a little bit in this podcast as well. But uh, not only that, but the three quarterbacks who played for the home teams here over the past two days, and Cozy Perry, Malik Rozier, and Brock Osweiler. Combined for 250 yards passing. Are you serious? The three quarterbacks, yes. repeating, oh the three quarterbacks. God. This is a passing era. Okay, this is not Bob Greasy in 1972. <laughs> this is unreal. Okay, 250 yards total passing from Osweiler. And that's, by the way, that's not net. That's gross. Okay? Right. Throw the sacks in there and it's under 200. <laughs> okay, that those three quarterbacks combined for. So, look, we know that we're not getting good quarterback play in this market. We know obviously that all of the teams down here are different degrees of mediocre. We're going to spare you the heat conversation yeah. here a little bit, but they've certainly sunk to that. The Panthers uh, have the fewest points in the East right now. They're uh, they're uh, right where the they were last year, though, which is games in hand. We've got games in hand when, when to you're, climb back up the standings. When you're doing games in hand <laughs> and it's before it, Thanksgiving, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a problem. That's a bad sign. Uh, when we have people on, on our network in Miami Heat Beat, uh, telling me to relax about the Heat and they'll figure it out when they've given up an average of 122 points a game over the past three and they pride themselves on their defense. Things are not good in South Florida sports right now. So I guess, Chris, we should be thankful for the Dolphins because they are still alive. 
They are 5-4 and four after what I thought was a pretty dreadful 13-6 to six victory over the Jets today. And we're going to try to cover three different topics here. But before we get to the specifics of the game and how it played out, and there's really not a lot of excitement to get to or specific plays, we're going to touch on the latest Dolphins controversy. So sure. for part one here, we've been focusing a lot on Ryan Tannehill, on Devontae Parker, in the offseason, it was should they sign, you know, should they keep Sue, should they sign Landry. And now the player who I felt was the best player on the team and has made the most impactful plays this season when he's been in the lineup, and he missed a couple of games, has been Rashad Jones. And his absence from the lineup was devastatingly felt mm -hmm. in the first kind of five games, particularly the New England game. Yes, and so supposedly he was healthy now. Now... He's been playing with a labrum issue, okay, for mm -hmm. a while. The Dolphins obviously are not particularly forthcoming when it comes to injuries, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Tannehill and others. But he's been playing hurt. But he's still been playing, in my view, reasonably well. And then today, during the first half, so this wasn't late in the game, during the first half, he's no longer in the game. And Minka Fitzpatrick is playing full-time at safety. And we've got people checking out whether or not Rashad is limping on the sidelines. Yep. And people spotted a small limp, but nothing severe. Right, he was like swinging his right leg out, like trying to like sort of flatten out an injury almost, like you would like ironing a shirt. Like he was just like swinging his leg out just to see if something might happen. But it, that that seemed to be optics more than anything else, because then Adam Gase confirms after the game he took himself out. That, that was his phrase. Was not, it was unequivocal about it because he, he was asked a follow-up question. So hang on a second. You're saying he took himself out. And he goes, yes, sir. He took himself out. And beyond that, now what gets weirder about it is not only did Gase say that and not elaborate, but Rashad Jones blew off the interview session, which the guys who are around here all the time, like Omar Kelly, say that Rashad has never done since he was drafted once. He, he's never done that. And when Cam Wake was asked at the podium – about Rashad and what they talked about together because they were kind of caught on camera talking. He said that's between him and I. Mm -hmm. So and, and he also went on on this whole thing about how it, when bad when players are running wide open in the secondary or when mm -hmm. yards are when there's a seventy yard run that means that someone has made a fatal error that someone has made a mistake. He said football is pretty simple. It's eleven men that have to do a job and if. I'm not in my gap on a run play, and that and the running back goes untouched for 70 yards. It's my fault, right? And so it's kind of a, a, it's something that was talked about in the press this week about Rashad Jones, mm -hmm. which is that he's a bit of a gambler. Right. He's a bit of someone who sort of deviates from script. This is something that Troy Polamalu got a lot of credit for, yes. that he would deviate from script and saw things that others didn't and would make the play. But when you don't make the play... It looks like Bobby McCain screaming out at the secondary, asking for help as Will Fuller runs past him for another 60-yard score. And this is something that could ostensibly fall at the lap of Rashad Jones. Well, uh, so it feels like a continuation of what happened a week ago Thursday. And so, like, maybe it wasn't something necessarily that played out in this game. Because, look, the Jets didn't have big plays. No. And, and that's why it was odd to me that Rashad was pulled out. So if it is indeed related to that, and it does seem like that mm -hmm. may be the case, then it obviously maybe Rashad did something that reminded the coaching staff of right. what they were telling or, them for 10 days to no longer do. Now, there was another theory that was being banded about, which was we're going to run guys through. Basically, TJ McDonald and Rashad Jones have had a monopoly on safety snaps, and it's led to, and the, and the three yards per carry guys have done a brilliant job of highlighting this, it's led to Minka Fitzpatrick not being in the game. When Minka Fitzpatrick is one of your three most impactful defensive players, even as a rookie, mm. you want him on the field at all times. And so maybe there was a defensive game plan that was, we're going to roll Minka Fitzpatrick through your positions, and occasionally you're going to miss a series or three or four downs because Minka is going to be playing your position, and maybe that's where Rashad Jones took offense, which is, I play every snap. Don't ever rotate me out of the game because you want to get the, ro the rookie. The rookie's going to play ahead of me? What are you talking about? And that could theoretically have played a role as well. Again, these are all theories because we don't have any clarity as to why Rashad Jones didn't play a single snap in the, and, in the second half. And, right. And so, you know, if they were going to roll him in and out, obviously he didn't get rolled back in. And like you said, maybe mm -hmm. he asked out in that situation. But it is a really strange circumstance considering... Again, you don't have it, and I'm going to touch on this when we get to the offense. 
you don't have that many impactful players on this roster. No. And all we keep hearing is, and we'll touch on this too, but everybody's hurt, right? Like, so they've lost Wilson, and they've lost two offensive linemen, and they've lost William Hayes, and then they lost, not that he was valuable this year, but they lost Tankersley, and they lost Vincent Taylor, and on and on and on mm-hmm. and on and on. And today they lost both their tackles at varying points in the game, and so right. on and so, so forth. And Stills is playing hurt, right? And Parker mm-hmm. was hurt earlier in the season. So we've heard all of it. A.J. Derby didn't come back today. So mm-hmm. they've lost a ton of players. After, after losing a tight end that was going to play in preseason. Right, Marquise Gray. Gray. Yeah. So they've lost all these different guys, and we keep hearing about what a tragedy it is. And then you have three players on this team who, to me, are three of your most important players. And one of them asks out of the game today for unknown reasons in Rashawn Jones. One of them in Kenyon Drake blew a blocking assignment early in the game and then didn't seem to touch the ball again. Mm-hmm. And the other in Kenny Stills told me, I spoke to him afterwards, that he feels pretty good. And I think he had a couple of targets again today. I mean, they, they didn't mm-hmm. get anything his direction. Now, part of that is because Brock can't throw it that far. But part of it is that you, you would think you would need to get Kenny Stills involved because he hasn't been involved in weeks, even when he's played. So for all the talk about injuries and boo-hoo-hoo, they've got three guys on this roster who are supposed to be important players, and they're not getting him the ball. And another player I feel is important for them, and Jakeem Grant, who I don't think touches the ball enough, and I think that's been a consistent problem. So we'll have to see what happens with Rashad Jones. Whatever it is, you can be confident that the Dolphins will not be forced right about it because <laughs> we've, we've gotten to this point here this season where with the Tannehill situation now that we kind of know what's been going on behind the scenes and what has and has not been reported by the team officially um, I, I don't expect the whole truth on this I think it'll be something that comes out a little bit later I will say though Adam Gay saying he pulled himself out of the game is more forthright than what you're describing, which is accurate, which is that the Dolphins have faking as, an injury as, for him. As, as most NFL organizations do, are fairly clandestine uh, about yeah, this I stuff. Know, I, I, but but like but Rashad Jones, like Adam Gay saying he pulled himself out of the game. It's not well, you know, he, he was injured or whatever. Yeah. Like they could have said something that wouldn't that would turn this into not a controversy. And Adam Gates declined to do that. Well, so, you're right. Maybe, maybe, look, maybe he wants to make an example of him. I mean, that, that's the other thing that Gates does mm-hmm. is he makes examples of guys. I mean, he's, he did that with Ajayi. He's done this with others late last year with calling out Landry for, you know, sort of that issue on the field. Getting ejected I, against I, Buffalo, I, yeah. Right. I, I feel like sometimes Gates does these things to prepare – the media and the fans for what he's right. planning to do. So maybe they're not planning on going forward with Rashad Jones after the season. Who mm-hmm. knows? But every, which, every which, time by the way, does something like which, this. Which, by the way, would highlight to me, and I, I was tweeting about this, that if you don't really rate Rashad Jones or Rashad Jones frustrates you, why don't you trade him at the deadline? Oh, God. Well, that's, that's like, all like, like I mean, can't, like Kansas City is aching for secondary help. Right. For me, it's the one thing that's going to stop them from winning the Super Bowl and you don't you mean to tell me that Rashad Jones couldn't help them or that if you don't fancy him at least maybe you can get a third round pick for him and look the dolphins have taken some pr hits for trading Jay Ajayi to a super bowl team for a fourth round pick right like that that was not well received just as the raiders trades have not been well received generally when you get mid round picks for exchange for guys that are helping you win now that's not going to be well received but i think i think Rashad Jones if if you don't think that he's part of your long term plans and you're ready to make an example out of him because he was making freelance mistakes against Houston, then you have to at least be thinking about trading him. Well, but here's the here's the issue with that. So okay, Rashad is thirty, going to be thirty one next year. Yep, and his contract was fully guaranteed this year. He's due next year uh, a little over thirteen million dollars. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and he's got a small workout bonus. His cap number is over 17, including the pro rate of the bonus. Okay, so he's got a $17 million cap number last year. It's almost as high as Tannehill. Um, but there would be dead money next year. Oh, yeah. No, you, 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 you couldn't so, cut him next so, year. So you you can only so you cut him in 2020. Cut. Right. So you're looking at over $23 million in dead money next year. So he's going to be on the roster. But this gets back to sort of another point here, which is that if you – look, you drafted a safety number 11 overall, and I was in favor of the pick, and the pick has worked out. Okay, it's one of the few good things they've done. Yeah. All right, so I'm fine with the Minka Fitzpatrick pick, but if you felt like T.J. McDonald was going to be part of your core, you gave him an extension. Before like, you even saw him playing a game. Before you saw him playing a game, right, because he missed the eight weeks last year. Then you're talking about having three safeties at the, there, and then it makes you question, okay, if you were comfortable with Rashad Jones, why were you taking Minka Fitzpatrick? And maybe you're not comfortable with Rashad Jones now. Anyway, this is going to be a controversy this week, sure. which will probably take some pressure off something else we're going to talk about here later, which is the Tannehill situation. We'll get back to our episode here in a second, but first I want to tell you about a great new sponsor of the Five Reasons Sports Network, and that is Brunt Insurance. Brunt Insurance offers all of your protection – 
under one roof. That means home, auto, commercial, and life insurance. And they're licensed to write insurance for the entire state of Florida. That's Pensacola all the way down to the Keys. They've got multiple carriers for all the product lines to ensure you're paying the lowest rate in your particular area. They're also a proud sponsor of the Homes for Heroes program, which offers special discounts for first responders, teachers, military, and healthcare professionals. Now, how do you find them? Go to BruntInsurance.com. That's Brunt, B-R-U-N-T, Insurance.com, or 954 589 22 Zero four. That's Brunt Insurance, and make sure to tell them that Five Reasons sent you. All right, so let's get to uh, number two here. We're going to try to be fair to the Dolphins by doing the positive first today yep. before I go on my gase rant. All right, so the defense, I mean, let's get off Matt Burke's case for a week. All yep. right. Um, the defense was really good today. Now, it was helped by the fact that Sam Darnold made two of the stupidest throws I've ever seen. I mean, Three he, of the stupidest throws. I mean, the, right. the, the, the last one at the end, there seemed to be enough space for him to go and run for that first down. And he decided to chuck it up, and there was the Aikens uh, interception. But the first two in particular that the linebackers picked off, I mean, he threw it right to them. I mean, it genuinely looked like Kiko Alonso was running a route and he was hitting him on a uh, nine-yard out. Like, yeah. it was that... Obvious that he was going to throw an interception straight to him. Yeah, no, it, it was it was a pretty awful game by Darnold. Now, with that being said, one of the things that we've criticized the Dolphins for the most is that they've gotten no pass rush this year. Yeah, they came into this game thirtieth in the league in sacks, and today Cam Wake played by far his best game of the year. Uh, it wasn't just the two and a half sacks; he also had three other pressures, mm-hmm. three other hits. H- had one where he hit his arm and it led to an incomplete pass. Yeah, he was outstanding today. Like uh, you know, and you talk about. And this is kind of when we've talked about a Frank Gore or a Dwayne Wade or a Cameron Wake. Like, there's moments of magic that these guys in their mid-30s still have. They can't do it every week, okay? Mm -hmm. But you can have a... You know, a Dwayne Wade game, two against Philadelphia in the playoffs last year. You can have a Cam Wake game like today. And it it allows them to kind of... It, it sort of push up against a narrative, which is that they're washed, right? right? That Frank Gore is washed, or that Dwayne Wade is washed, or that Cam Wake is washed. Again, it's not that it's gone. It's not that they can never be good. It's that they're not good as often. Right. And, but I, I guess with Cam Wake, it had been eight games. Yeah. And so you're thinking, oh, it might just be gone. Like, Because right. that can happen sometimes. But uh, he reminds you again, and I think other teams still respect him to this degree. He still keeps himself in such immaculate shape that, to me, it's not that crazy that he was that brilliant today. But you can tell from the opening snap that this is going to be a Cam Wake game yeah. and that he was going to put Sam Darnold under a ton of pressure. Well, we were waiting for that game. And, and to give Cam some credit here, I mean, both guys, uh, Frank Gore and, and Cam Wake, uh, you know, Frank Gore passed Barry Sanders for sixth all-time in all-purpose yards today, which is incredible, even if Barry retired about five years earlier than he sure. should have. Um, and Cam had, now has 95 sacks uh, through 10 seasons. And, you know, you think about that, you're like, okay, why doesn't he have more? Because he didn't come into the NFL till he was 27 years old. He he is the best thing that Jeff Ireland found for this franchise. He's the best thing that, that Ireland left for them, was going mm-hmm. out and getting him out of the CFL, playing 10 years. Just for some context on how good Cam Wake has been, Jason Taylor threw his first 10 seasons at 106 sacks, and Cam has 95. Wow. So it's not that far off. Now, Jason had some productivity a little bit mm-hmm. later, but not as much. And Cam Wake kind of got started more in what you would call prime years well, he in terms s- of in the NFL. In, in the NFL, but again, didn't start his NFL career until 27. And right. so, you know, whereas Jason was playing in the NFL it, at 22. It's an, it's an all-time personnel move. Like, by yep. by a group of people that are generally— made a bunch of bad ones. Right, they made a bunch of bad ones. Like, that's a legendary personnel move to find a guy in the CFL yep. that is a, an all-time figure in your franchise's history. Well, What's, what's amazing about it is that the Dolphins have had more success going to the CFL in recent years than they have going to college football. They, they found what was their best offensive lineman for about a six-year period, Mark Dixon, was a guy that, that Jimmy Johnson found under the CFL. And he would if he hadn't gotten hurt, he might have given them another three or four years. And then to find a guy who was an even higher level in Wake. So credit to him. I thought the secondary was exceptional today, regardless of whether Rashad Jones played. Uh, Xavier Howard, I thought, played his best game in weeks. That was a key there. Um, I thought that the linebacker play was much better. I mean, the Jets really didn't break anything off at all. And so defensively, they were really good. And they had to be because, as we're going to touch on in Part 3, the offense was absolutely pathetic. And so this reminded me a little bit more of the beginning of the season right? where the Dolphins could not sustain drives, could not stay on the field, kept forcing their defense to go out there. And today, their, their defense was good. And I wonder... 
if it had anything to do with having the extra rest. Because one of the issues I think that the Dolphins ran into early in the year was playing week after week after week on the field all the time because the offense just, the Adam Gase offense sucks, okay? So to be on the field that much, and I think they just broke. And we talked about that last week. I think they just broke. And I think getting 10 days off, and particularly a guy like Wake, who's 36, yeah. getting 10 days mm-hmm. off after the Thursday night game, getting right, and, and he was a real factor today. And, look, they did this. No Vincent Taylor, no William Hayes, no Woodard. Okay? I mean, they're really thin on the defensive line at this stage. They were good. Their linebacker play was good. So I do want to give them credit. I, I don't think this changes the overall narrative on Matt Burke. I think he still has to be monitored over the last seven weeks. I think if the Dolphins can upgrade at that spot, they should. But I think it does get people off his – his back right now. So let's go to part three. I, I just yeah. I just want to say on the defense, and you talk about the way that uh, they at times have both won and lost games for them. I find that totally confounding. Like you go to the Titans game, they basically allowed 13 points because they also allowed a special teams touchdown in that game. They allowed 12 to the Jets, but then, in my opinion, gave up way too much to the Raiders, especially when you've seen uh, what's happened to them since. Then the, the then the Patriots game, but then you look at the Bengals game. And the Bengals game, they only gave up 10 points in theory because there was a, a fumble slash interception return for a mm-hmm. touchdown. You only gave up 10 offensive points in that game. And then today, you only give up six in the defense who wins you the game. So at varying points, they both done enough to win and then lost. Right. And then they have not done enough, like in the Bears game, and the offense has kind of won them the game for them anyway. So it's kind of – the, the vacillation is confusing, and it's something that I asked Adam Gase about, which is how do things change like this mm. from week to week? And he went on about uh, – he, he was he was saying all week long and, and continued to emphasize the idea of communication between lines, that, that linebacking mm-hmm. and secondary and defensive line were all working in concert in a way that it is warrant in, in their last couple of games. But – how do you go from being a team that gives up 10 offensive points to the Bengals, 12 to the Jets, and 6 to the Jets, 13 to the Titans, and then not be able to get off the field against Houston and against and against Detroit and against New England and against Chicago? Like the There have been half, four yeah. truly appalling performances mixed in with three or four great ones. I, I don't know. I don't know how to make heads well, or tails I, Well, I, I think some of it could be youth. I mean, we're talking about age with Cam Wake, but, I mean, they've got a lot of young players playing. I mean, they, they have – they have young players in that linebacker group. They had young players playing at defensive tackle. Um, I mean, Charles Harris doesn't. But is Charles Harris still on the team? I mean, I, you know, <laughs> he's I mean, he's that, on a calf injury. I, I mean, I, I mean, yeah. it's, it's another first round pick that I, we'll, we'll see in training camp next year. And then, you know, and then the defensive backfield. Like, I mean, they still have young players. Like, I mean, Minka and Xavier Howard may be two of their highest upside players on the team. Right. But they're young guys. They a also ro- rookie and a, basically a rookie and Baker McMillan in the linebacking core too. Right. And Bobby McCain, you know, was not really healthy for a couple weeks. So I think that leads to some of the vacillation, but I do think a lot of it is the offense's inability to stay on the field. So let's get to my favorite topic here. (laughs) Um, I mean, the Dolphins came into today 27th in the league in offense. Um, They're going to drop after today, and I'm going to give you some more numbers, some more Adam Gase offensive genius numbers. Um, Second half today, number of plays that they ran on their five drives. Six, three, 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 tribute to Dwayne Wade <laughs> with a little, and, and, with a little and, LeBron thrown in. And they were three for 16 on third down. Uh, three for 16 <laughs> on third down. They, also, they had 43 yards in the second half. They had seven first downs total, just for some um, perspective on that one. They've only had fewer than that once in their history. Their history and one. Okay, and this is, again, a franchise that won, like, all of its games in 1972, and a lot of times didn't score more than 17 points while doing it. They've never had fewer than six and one. They had six against the Jets in 2010 and won the game. A couple other times they've had seven. Um, I mean, there. This is this is a historically bad Dolphin offense. It it just is. And and I, I'm sorry. I mean, there's no other way to look at it at this stage. And we can talk about well, they don't have Albert Wilson. Okay. They don't have Albert Wilson. They had four of their other top five receivers out there on the field. Okay, they don't have Marquise Gray. They have their number two, you know, their second round pick in Gasicki out there for every snap now. And Who had one target and zero catches. One target and zero catches. Been a non-factor for most of the year. The the running game. They had both guys that they want in Drake and Gore. And yes, the offensive line is a shit show right now. Okay, because. 
they're not healthy there, and they don't have Sitton. They don't have Kilgore, who was not playing at a high level when he got hurt anyway. Uh, Jawan James went out. Does That doesn't appear serious. Mm-hmm. He seemed fine after the game. And, and Adam Gay said after the game that uh, if there is even a crevice on the offensive line, Frank Gore will get four yards through it. So he, he's pretty clear in saying who he thinks the running game is on. Right. Okay, so... The reality, and then Tunsil, you know, went out late, but mm-hmm. uh, but but, and he didn't speak after the game. But um, so they've had offensive line issues. I, I get that, and I understand how important the offensive line is. But like, you should not be a historically bad offense, and they're historically bad. They're historically bad. And don't give me the quarterback thing. We we had, uh, you know, I, I had this debate with our buddy Slim from Ballscast on you know on Twitter out and open today. We do this a lot in our DM string. But, you know, he, he's talking about the difference between Tannehill and Osweiler. I'm done with that. Okay, I'm done with that. Is Ryan Tannehill better than Brock Osweiler? Yes. Okay. You and I, though, both felt that Osweiler had run the offense better than Tannehill did yeah. to this point. I polled this thing on five reasons. We got more than 2,000 votes, and it was like 52% for Ryan and 48% for Brock. Whatever the difference is between them, okay, this is not, as I've said before, going from Aaron Rodgers to one of the Green Bay backups, okay, like, you know what, like a Hundley was, okay? Deshaun Kaiser. Uh, Deshaun Kaiser at this stage, right, okay? This is not th- this is not that, okay? This is going from a guy who is slightly above average to going to a guy who is slightly below average. And that's it. That's not that wide a gap, Okay. There is no reason at this stage that this offense, under an offensive genius, should be this bad. And now, we are now 12 games. 12 games. You said I could leave today's game (laughs) after this happened. We are now 12 games straight that they have not scored on their opening drive. Not a single point. Kansas City scored again today on its opening drive, which means their last 12 opening drives, they've scored 61 points. Okay? The max is eighty four. They've scored. <laughs> they've scored. They've well, scored sixty. I guess the max would be ninety six if you if they, if they went for a two point uh, every went, time. Which right, they probably <laughs> should do because they get it. Okay, so sixty one points. And don't give me. Well, they have Mahomes. They went up and traded for Mahomes. Um, uh, this uh, and, and the Chiefs, by the way, went ninety five yards in their first drive. Okay, right. I mean, the Dolphins actually went. I think thirty five yards in their first drive today, and that was significant. In fact, the Dolphins' longest play from scrimmage today was their first play. Yeah. Wait, the twenty, the twenty-six yard the pass. Twenty-six yarder at Amendola was, the longest, was the longest oh play from God. scrimmage. Was the only play they had over sweet, nineteen yards. Sweet Jesus. Okay, this is okay, and I know Steve Rose is not listening to this podcast. This, if he is or somebody close to him is, this has to be seriously evaluated. It just does. Mm-hmm. Okay, you brought in an offensive coach, and they're fucking pathetic on offense. Okay, and and you can you can give me the offensive line and all the rest of this stuff. And you can give me the Kenny Stills is banged up today, all right? Or the Brock can't throw out of a box, okay? A, a box the size of this press box that we're doing it in right now. But but you you cannot be in a situation where you're getting seven first downs in a modern NFL game. It is not 1972, yeah. okay? And so, look, that's why I'm saying to Matt Burke, not only should Matt Burke not be fired after today's game, he should get a 10-year contract extension. Be- well, <laughs> no, I don't want to do that to people. But, but, but I mean, th- the problem coach here, to me – is the offensive coach, and it has been most of this season, and that got overshadowed over the last two and a half games because they went through this stretch where in 26 drives they gave up 17 scoring plays, okay, but between touchdowns and field goals, and so and 103 total points, I think, and so we were like, oh, Matt Burke sucks, but. Okay, but the bigger problem this year has been on the other side, statistically and otherwise. And so I, I just I don't understand. And, look, I was in the locker room today. I know Gase didn't get asked about it again, okay? But I, I, I just I don't know what the explanation is for that. Why are they so bad out of the gates every single game? And today it was compounded because they were even worse in the second half. They ran – they had five drives, Chris, in the second half, and they ran three plays – more than what you would say would be the minimum, right? Yep. I mean, unless you had an, a turnover. Mm-hmm. Three plays, more than the minimum. They ran five drives, and they totaled 43 yards. So so, so, can I ask so, you, so, so let me ask you this question. I, I mean, I, I, at this point, like, what else do I say? Like, okay, but my question is, so do you think that this team is, this offense is being schemed poorly? Do you think that... The play calling is bad. Do you think that... Do they do, need do, to throw on every third and one? <laughs> do they need to throw on every third and one? Well, I mean, they couldn't get a yard with Frank Gore uh, in the second half. Uh, like, uh, every time... Like, they did run on a third and uh, one. Yes, they did. And they it got stopped for a three-yard loss. Do you need to throw on third and one? Do you need to, to basically drop your quarterback back, have whatever, five-step drop, okay, 
when you you're playing your backup right tackle? Do you do you with need, a, with three backup offensive linemen in the game? Do you right? Do you need to throw on third and one? Mm-hmm. Do you need to show everybody how smart you are? And then they've got like second and fourteen situations and they're running. And and, I, and I'm just, I'm I don't I, I feel like a lot of what he does is and we've talked about this. We were talking about this when they were three and zero. Oh. Like this is not new. This is not. We're talking about it after a win. A lot of what he does is to show the world how smart he is. I think that's how it mm-hmm. comes off. Okay. And, and you think he's being counterintuitive on purpose, right? Okay, and so and, and there's a certain point. I under I I am good with some creativity. Okay, but the creativity has not worked this year. The two creative things that have worked, there've been two trick plays that worked, two trick plays. But as far as the sort of gaming the down and distance situation, it's been a flop the whole year. The whole year. Okay, they are a terrible third down team. That's on the coach. Okay, they are a terrible first drive team. That's on the coach. And the only thing that has been able to hold them up the whole year has been, well, they've made some adjustments in game, like, for example, the Chicago game here, the, you know, when we were here. And again, today, that was a disaster. So, and here's the other point, okay? So, we keep talking about players that are not available to them. What's going on with Kenyon Drake? He's healthy. Yeah. He's healthy. He it's just that he misses a block early in the game, and you're done with it. He was saying that they were trying to get him the ball in the second half, but that Todd Bowles always had it. Always had him like that was like he was saying that Todd Bowles made Kenyon Drake priority number one, and that he couldn't get him the ball when okay. things were called for him. All right, you and I are watching the the Saints game. Yep. Okay, they're up thirty four to fourteen on the Rams before the half. half. Before the half. Okay, as we're taping this, it's a little before. It's around six mm-hmm. o'clock. Okay. Uh, I, I think Alvin Kamara just scored. Okay. Do you think teams are trying to take Alvin Kamara out of the game? <laughs> do, do, you, do you think so? I, I do, think, yeah. Do you think yeah, teams are scheming do, to take yeah. Alvin Kamara off the game? Do you think the teams have been scheming to get Todd Gurley out of the game? Yep. Okay. So, I, I don't understand it. I, e- either, one of two things is true here. Either Kenyon Drake simply doesn't do anything he's told to do, mm-hmm. which is possible. I don't know. Right. Okay. I think... I think I, I really do think that what Adam Gay said about Frank Gore is so instructive, which is you give him a crevice, he will get me four yards. I think he just wants sec- second and six. But w- the, one of the things I was talking about with Jason Leisure and why I think you're absolutely right to have a go at him over uh, over over Kenyon Drake is that who on the field today, if Albert Wilson is not playing, mm-hmm. and Jakeem Grant is not really playing either, we'll check and see what his snap count ended up being in the game. But if those two guys aren't playing, who's getting you the 50-yard touchdown? And did you and well, especially and, when and, you, and, you can't even look at Kenny Stills, right? Like, like uh, right, exactly. Like and and when you have seven offensive first downs, don't you want to give the ball to Kenyon Drake twenty times just to see if one of those is a fifty yarder? I, I this all, right, and here's my whole thing about this, and this applies to any sport, okay, but particularly the NFL and the NBA. This idea of they were trying to take this guy away, and so we had to go another direction. To me, is lazy coaching. It's lazy coaching. If you have a player who is better than the guys he's going against, it is your job as a coach to put that guy in the best possible position to exploit that advantage. Mm-hmm. And it's always driven me crazy with NBA coaches too. They're like, oh, well, why, why didn't you go to him? You know, why, why didn't you feature him in the second half? Well, they were, they were, you know, they were doubling him. They were shading him. They were doing whatever. Okay. So, so run some, you know, run some back screen action, run something. Okay. To get that guy free because that guy is better than those guys. Okay. So one of two things is true here. What could be one of three things? One, Kenyon Drake may not be that good. Mm-hmm. Okay. In which case, then that's another busted pick. And you and I don't agree with that because you and I both thought he was their best player the last five or six games of last season. Number two is he may not be doing what Adam Gase wants him to do. And if that's the case, I mean, this is becoming a little tired because, I mean, I feel like this is – and now we've got a Rashad Jones situation. But right. but we had it with Landry. We had it with Sue, right? He was freelancing too much, right? We heard that stuff get yes. out. Okay. Parker, okay? And Parker's got a separate set of issues, sure. okay? But and, like, and another disappointing performance. Another disappointing today. performance. One but, catch for eight yards. Right. Okay. After yes, last week was supposedly the breakout, right, against Houston. But – we're hearing this over and over and over in their players. So those are the two things. And, or the third option, okay, which is also not flattering, is that the coach is not doing enough to basically force feed the guy mm-hmm. the ball so that, yes, I mean, again, he's not Barry Sanders, okay? But Barry Sanders had a ton of minus threes. Yes. Okay? And then he'd have a 73. Yeah. All right? And the average looked great. And, and how are you going to get Kenyon Drake the 45-yard play if you're giving him the ball three times a half? 
Mm-hmm. How is that happening? Three carries total, four catches total. I, I mean, this it's is... Not, it's not enough. It's, it's not enough. It's not enough, and we've said this every week. So we're going to find out later that there was some issue behind the scenes because this is what keeps happening. Right. It, this is a pattern with this coach and this, this organization at this point. They're going to find out that something was going on behind the scenes that Kenya Drake either wasn't in his playbook or wasn't doing something they wanted to... And, mm-hmm. that, and it, they're going to start trickling it out through certain reporters to sort of paint a picture. I mean, right. it's the same deal, and it's frustrating because this is a horrible offense right now. The only thing that's propping them up from being a bottom bottom two offense is that Arizona and Buffalo are historically bad. Yeah. Okay, not just historically bad for a franchise like the Dolphins are. Historically bad in like the last 25 years. Like Arizona is averaging in fewer NFL than, history. In NFL history. <laughs> right. Arizona is, I mean, you have to go back to a point where you could basically not just touch receivers, but throw them on the ground. Okay. <laughs> to find a time that an offense was as bad as Arizona's. Arizona's averaging about 220, 230 yards a game right now. Okay. So, you know, Miami's better than that. That's the only thing that's propping them up. And Buffalo is, I mean, Buffalo is playing. Buffalo is going to go with Nathan Peterman 6,000 times just to not have to sign Colin Kaepernick. They're going <laughs> to just gonna keep rolling him out there because, because, you know, the people of Buffalo are not going to tolerate Colin Kaepernick. They're going to keep throwing him out there. He might be the worst quarterback we've seen. And in like, the you, past just, you just pencil years. him in for a pick six, and he got one today along with three interceptions. Yeah, I mean, they lost 41 to nine, okay? <laughs> I mean, I mean be, between the three of them, between the three, and the, and the Patriots have not played yet, between the Jets, the Bills, and the Dolphins today, what do we get? We got 28 points and seven interceptions. Okay, great stuff. <laughs> so, so to cl- to close this on the Gase offense, um, I, I mean, I'm not going to roll out all the other stats again. Right. You know, Kansas City so, went over 26 so, so you, again. So you don't. So you don't think Adam Gase is doing his job, or well enough? I don't think he's a good offensive coach. I, I just I think yeah. there's an, there's enough evidence to me yeah. at this point that you, I don't. I, I, my, I I'm still on the players. I still don't. Th- I think at quarterback they're not good enough. I think at offensive line you, they're not good but enough. But you know what you're doing? You are you are giving Gase the Tannehill treatment, the same treatment that Ryan Tannehill has gotten here for the past few years. Mm-hmm. Okay, which was if Ryan only had an offensive line, if Ryan only had receivers, if Ryan only had, and I was one of those people. I was because I I have sort of not said Tannehill's great, but I've always said he's good enough, okay? And I've been one of those people. And now I feel like this is transferred to Gase, where it's, well, if he only had this. And my thing on it is, like, a lot of this Gase chose. Like, I, So, no, yeah. did he did he choose for Sitton and Kilgore to get hurt? No. Did he choose for Albert Wilson, who looked like the real find of the front office this offseason and was a personal find of his, okay, somebody that he really targeted? Did he choose for him to get hurt? No. Okay, I totally mm-hmm. get that. All right, but... He reshaped this roster. He didn't want Jarvis Landry anymore. We decided that was a good decision. He didn't want J.H.I.E. anymore. That was a good decision. Okay, so you wanted Kenny Stills, right? But you're not getting him the ball. You wanted Kenya Drake, you're not getting him the ball. And now we're going through another thing where it's like, okay, I don't think he's soured on Stills. I don't think Stills is healthy, and I don't think Brock can throw the ball far enough. I think that's the problem. But with Drake, he's basically made a decision that this guy he thought was good enough is not good enough. If you think a running back is good, you don't treat him like a third down back. You made a point on uh, on our DM string, like, Theo Riddick for, like, uh, for Detroit. Yeah. I mean, they'll at least throw the ball to him eight yeah. or nine times. He's like, like a PPR, like, he's a great player in PPR James, fantasy football because he gets 10 targets a game. James White, okay? Yep. James White is going to get targeted eight to ten times a game. If it, he's, It's a release option, okay, for Brady. Like, the, Kenny Drake might as well not be on the team. Like, they're not even – so – and he's not on the team when you have, again, a historically mm-hmm. bad Dolphins offense, a horrible Dolphins offense. And the counterexample – for my argument, I'm going to provide it myself, mm. is that the Rams' offense in 2016 was appalling mm-hmm. with basically the same group of players. Maybe you throw in a Cooper Cup and maybe an offensive lineman or two as the team that Sean McVay had electrifying the NFL and still has electrifying the NFL, even though they're losing right now as we tape to the Saints. Right. Like, it, it is still an electrifying offense with almost the same personnel. So I, I'm I'm always generally a players more than coaching kind of mm-hmm. guy, but we've seen some notable examples both in football and in basketball in which from one coach to the next, things dramatically change. Yes. And so there could be a McVay out there that's waiting to turn around an offense, that's waiting for an opportunity, and we th- basically – we thought that Gase would be McVay. We thought that Gase would be Kyle Shanahan, which take a quarterback literally off the street uh-huh. and run over the Raiders for by four touchdowns on Thursday Night Football. Now, Kyle Shanahan's record would seem to indicate that you know, like he's not a good coach, but 
You watch what he did with Nick Mullins. Right. And has C.J. Beathard at least moving the ball with the 49ers. Like, there is, I think, no question that a coach can turn around an offense. And that Adam Gase, even if, which is my point of view, which is I don't think he's harming, uh, he's not, I don't think he's holding this offense back. Right, I don't think that there's much to hold back, but he's not. Ex- what, what else with? But here's my thing about it: like, how much worse could it be? Like, like other than throwing a ton of picks, their drives in the second half were six plays, three plays, three plays, three but, plays. But do you think there's an underlying talent that's not being that, that's I, I, like I, like when Brock Osweiler's your quarterback? Like, uh, okay. yes, he's been solid. He moves the offense, but he's still Brock Osweiler. He's Brock, okay, last year, okay, you had. Which McCown, Josh McCown, right, with the Jets. Which McCown? <laughs> okay, right, which McCown? You had Josh McCown with the Jets, okay? That team moved with uh, – there ain't great offensive coaches with the Jets. We saw that today, yeah. okay? All right? Todd Bowles is not known as a great offensive mm-hmm. coach, okay? Yeah. He's certainly, I mean, that's not even his background. He's a safety, yeah. okay? They moved the ball last year. Like, this is uh, – again, this is a historically bad Dolphin offense. It is the worst offense in Dolphin History. History. Okay? They had guys named Dick Wood playing quarterback <laughs> before Greasy got here. Literally, his name is Dick Wood. Look it up. He's not, that's he don't, he, that's he's not no, true. It's Seriously. true. He's no longer alive. Look it up. It, Dick Wood. I don't believe he's alive. <laughs> they had A.J. Feely playing quarterback here. Yeah. They had Ray Lucas playing quarterback here. They had Tyler Thigpen, Cleo Lemon, John mm-hmm. oh, John Beck was awful. But yeah. they, they had a lot of really bad quarterbacks here, and, he, and they made it work. Look. I'm like the you know the biggest Jay Feeler stand on the planet, okay? <laughs> but you're you're telling me that that those offenses were better than this offense. And look at those offenses. Yes, you had Ricky Williams after that. The 2000 season with Chan Gailey as the offensive coordinator, you had Lamar Smith off the scrap heap as your running back, who by the way provided their only playoff victory in the last 20 years, right, with 209 yards. Lamar Smith, Aronde Gadsden, I love to death. Aronde, okay, was a guy who came out of Arena League. Okay, cut by three other organizations, uh, and what was his name? Um, Shepard, Leslie Shepard, right? I remember who was, him. Who, yeah. was, who was at nice guy at best a number four receiver? Okay, those were their starters: Lamar Smith, Ronde Gadsden, and Leslie Shepard. It's the year before our new partner here, Chris Chambers, was drafted, and that team won eleven games and moved the ball offensively and was much better offensively than this with Chan Gailey as the offensive coordinator under. Dave, it's 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 okay to punt once that, okay? <laughs> I, I'm tired of the Adam Gase offensive genius stuff. I, it's just it, it, you, the numbers are what the numbers yeah. are, and that's that's where. All right, so let's go to number four here because I could go on this all day. We'll get back to the episode here in a second, but first we got to tell you about another watch party. You know how much fun the Dolphins are to watch these days. Incredible fun. Well, maybe not always, but they're fun. And you to, know how successful we are uh, when we watch the Did Dolphins you have to mention together. That? Did you have to mention that? <laughs> well, here, look. If you're gonna suffer through a Dolphins game. Game, suffer through it with us. Yes, that, that should be the tagline. <laughs> that should be the tagline. Suffer through the Dolphins with us. And you can do that this week at Uncle Al's in Sunrise. That's 10033 Sunset Strip in Sunrise. This is the new Uncle Al's. It's in the same shopping center as Doris Italian Market. The Dolphin game this week has been moved to a 4 o'clock start. So make sure you get out there starting at around 3 o'clock. We're going to have food specials. We're going to have drink specials. We're going to have giveaways. We've got hats to give away. We've got shirts to give away. All kinds of cool stuff. There'll be hosts from all throughout the Five Reasons Sports Network. And the biggest thing is you can help us break the streak. We're now 0 for 5 reasons in watch parties. <laughs> so, being an idiot, I decided to have a watch party for a road game in Lambeau in the fall <laughs> we're, against we're, Aaron Rodgers with Brock Osweiler. We're trying to go 1 in 5 reasons against Aaron Rodgers. Right. So it seems it, like a sound strategy. Help us defy the odds. Help us <laughs> defy the odds. And come out to Uncle Al's in Sunrise again. That's this Sunday, Give that address the 11th. again. Because I, I heard for the last time we were at Uncle Al's that a they bunch of people they, went they, to the other yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so it's one zero zero three three Sunset Strip. One zero zero three three Sunset Strip. It's basically Sunset Strip and Knob Hill near Sunrise Boulevard mm. in Sunrise. So number four here is the Tannehill situation. Yep. Because I feel we need to touch on it again. And um, you know he's not going to play next week against the Packers. Um, mm-hmm. You know, our Chris Kaufman has been up front on all this. You should look back on some at CK Parrott's tweets. You know, he's been right about this five different times. Um, the Dolphins have parsed details on this, and then the beat guys have come in and parsed the details after them. Uh, but the reality is this. We've had it right every single time about when he was not going to play. 
and we've said he's not going to play this next week mm-hmm. either. Um, and then they have a bye. Now, what is, the specifics of the injury, this is the way that it's been described to me by Chris Kaufman. Um, he has a capsule injury. The Dolphins finally cop to that. Yep. Okay, after weeks of – you know, HIPAA violation. We can't speak because it's a HIPAA violation. <laughs> or Ryan can throw if he wants to, and all the rest of this. Okay, they basically came out and told the beat guys that he has a capsule injury, and then a lot of the beat writers came out also and said that there's no labrum issue because that's I think that's the assumption. Capsule injury. Okay, that's it. Um, the reality, from what we understand of the capsule injury, and this is from people directly involved in the process, and also some people who are familiar with shoulder injuries, is that with a capsule injury, it is basically like sort of the, uh, what would you call it? It's it's sort of the vortex of the shoulder. Everything mm-hmm. goes around it. And essentially, labrum can, can be affected by that. Mm-hmm. Okay, The labrum can be affected by that. And it is our belief that he has a labrum problem as well. Okay, uh, It's more than a belief. Let's just put it that way. It's mm-hmm. more than a belief. Um, and so... You know, this is a strength issue. This is not a pain issue with him. It's not like Ryan suck it up and go out there. This is he cannot make the throws, okay? He cannot make them. If he's asked to throw beyond a certain yardage, he cannot make the throws. And so a lot of Dolphin fans, ha, 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 j- jumped on this. Well, he could make the throws anyway. The reality is Ryan throws with good velocity yep. normally, throws with better velocity Very good than strength. Osweiler. He has good arm strength. He does not have that right now. And so he's not playable right now. And the question becomes two things here, Chris. One, does the arm strength come back now over the next two weeks after the Green Bay game? We're assuming it's a road game. Gase teams don't play well on the road. You're going against Aaron Rodgers. The Green Bay Packers are going to need that game. It's an important game for them. Particularly if they lose tonight to the Patriots. Right. So they need that game, okay, to stay in the NFC playoff picture, uh, particularly where the Bears and some other teams are playing. So and you talk about home road splits. Green Bay's are pretty staggering. Right. They're, they're so, really good at home, terrible on the road. The Dolphins are going to be a 10-point underdog okay, next week, I believe. So your, your reality is you're probably going to be 5-5. Five and five. And so the question – there's really two questions here. One is, does Ryan's strength come back to the point that Gase is comfortable with him? And two – Is there any point to putting him back out there? And I think that's really where we're headed, and that's what Chris Kaufman was talking about on the pod a couple weeks ago, why he said he doesn't think Ryan's going to play for the Dolphins anymore. Uh, It's not just that it's a debilitating injury. It's that even if the strength comes back, what is the point? In other words, he's making $18.5 million next year. We don't believe you're going forward with him. If Gase is going to stick around, it's probably because he has to separate himself from Tannehill. So you put all of those things together. Now, the only thing that could push you is you could say you had seven first downs today with Brock Osweiler, um, and maybe it gets worse. And you still think you're in the playoff race. And you still think you're in the playoff race. My belief, this is not reporting, but it's based on our reporting, is that I don't think Ryan's going to start another game this year. That's just my belief, okay? I'm not reporting that, not throwing that out anywhere. But if you just put all these pieces together, again, Gase needs to separate himself. Brock not making big mistakes. I mean, again, today, say what you will about Brock. He didn't cost them the game, right? He hasn't cost them games, okay? I, I, <laughs> he's not, when, you, when you score six offensive points, he did his best to cost the team the game. Right, but he didn't throw a pick six. Like he's Right, not, he's, right, he's, exactly. He's, 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 right, not, which he's is, not Nathan Peter. Which is why we were talking Darnold's earlier. Darnold's cost them the game. Oh, 100%. Dar- Darnold, Darnold the, cost the them the game. The reason why, like, from an offensive point of view, like, people, the, the fans were booing when they ran the ball on mm-hmm. third and 14, and I'm like... If you don't throw an interception and kick a field goal in this game, that's a positive outcome. Correct. Like as much as we talk, as much as we talked about the offense, and certainly it was atrocious today. But as long as Brock Osweiler isn't throwing pick sixes, that's a good result in my opinion. Right. So so there's no rush in my opinion to uh, Ryan's better than Brock, but there's no rush. The, the difference again, as I said earlier, not mm-hmm. it's so great that you. I say Ryan Tannehill's those. best performance is better. Is, than is, Brock. is a good deal better than Osweiler's. Right. But I guess. The issue is that, A, you don't get it often enough, and, B, do you think you'll get it often when he's coming off a major injury? Right. When The, the answer to that question is probably no. Probably no. And, and, and also, here's another thing to consider. So if you have no offensive line, like, like I mean, I think Juwan James is probably going to be healthy. We don't know about Tunsil. But, you know, you've got guys going down constantly in the offensive line. Do you want to throw Ryan back, da- back there in that particular situation, even if you're not planning on keeping him next year? Mm-hmm. Do you want to do that? 
And, you know, if Brock runs the offense smoother and gets rid of the ball, the one thing Brock does, I mean, it looks awful a lot of the time, but it's, a, you know, it's what he's supposed to do. He'll get out of the pocket. He can't make a play out of the pocket. He can't to save his life. <laughs> but, but, but he did but, run for a first down today. One re- of the seven first downs was via Osweiler's legs. Uh, that's so sad. <laughs> I mean, but, he, but he, he, can't, he can't really make a play out of the pocket like Ryan can, but he'll chuck the ball out of bounds, right? And yeah. so – so if your offensive line is bad, you just need someone to get you into your offense, then I, I think all those factors together, yeah. I don't believe, and you can clip this and play this later if I'm wrong, I don't believe that you're going to see Ryan start for them again this year. I, I just don't. I, I think I would agree with you if they had lost today mm-hmm. and if they had lost more. That, But I think these victories, and I was talking with Adam Beasley about this after the game, that because I mentioned my idea of trading Rashad Jones, and he goes, Adam Gase won't do that because Adam Gase still thinks that he's he's got a chance. That he right. thinks that they've got a chance to make the playoffs, and he thinks that they've got like they need to try to win, and that this season is about winning. When I feel like a lot of people from the beginning have felt like the season is not about winning; it's about maybe going three and thirteen and trying to get a draft pick. But I don't think Adam Gase is the type to pack it in. So if Ryan Tannehill can go, I think he's going to go. And this week uh, there was a lot of uh, sort of discussion about Adam Gase's argument with Armando Salguero, the Miami Herald, about his uh, about his sort of position that uh, that Ryan Tannehill had not improved. Adam Gase was pretty strongly arguing he thought Ryan Tannehill had improved and that Ryan Tannehill was playing well. It still feels like he believes in Ryan Tannehill. No, see, and, and, and I, think, gonna, he, I think you're I, reading that wrong. I think he's going to go to his grave with Ryan Tannehill. I, I think you're reading that wrong. I I, I think. Um... I think there's a couple reasons Gase did that, okay? I think Gase took that question as an indictment of Gase, not Mm. an indictment of Tannehill. I think that that is because, remember, Gase came here under the pretext that he was going to fix Ryan Tannehill. And that the Dolphins were a good Ryan Tannehill away from being a good team. Right, and so then Gase points, and he pointed to it again, to the way that Tannehill was playing in 2016, which was largely publicly credited to Gase, right? Yep. Because Tannehill was better during those 13 games, particularly the last seven, than he had been previously in his career. That was a reflection on Gase. The reason that you came out of that first season feeling good about Gase was why. It was the way that Tannehill played. That team didn't mm-hmm. beat the pants off anybody. They were minus in point differential. But it was, oh, Ryan looked better. Okay, so we got the right coach. That's the way it was framed. I don't think this is – and I think that's going to be the argument that is made by Gase to the front office, if the front office is still here, but mostly to the man upstairs, okay? yeah. not the man way upstairs. <laughs> but, but, the, but The the, the guy who signs the checks. The guys who, guy who signs the checks have built this beautiful stadium. By the way, I do want to say this. I mean, I just it's it's infuriating to me that Steve Ross is so bad at the football side because he's so good at the other stuff. Yeah. The stadium really is beautiful. I got to tell you, I it was really, here really, I was here for the Canes game and the conditions were torrential. Uh-huh. And I left the stadium as if I'd walked into a dome. Like there It's a like, really nice stadium. Like it's gorgeous. I'm sitting in the upper deck and these players are playing on this waterlogged pitch. Mm-hmm. I'll call it a pitch. And uh <laughs> and, and and uh and and like it was it looked awful to play in and I'm sitting like why do I why am I so comfortable? I shouldn't be this comfortable. I'm really comfortable. I'm having a nice time. Right. It's a, and not only that, but we we had this discussion about who has the best food of the four venues. It's not close. Oh god, this place it's is here. amazing food. I mean, I, w- I went out at halftime. I got myself a Schuler burger. Like this is this is it, it's yeah. a, it's a really good venue. There's a Cafe Versailles Cuban sandwich oh, available. Right. He's he's really good at the soccer stuff too, as you know. Yeah. And he's really bad at the football stuff. But at some point, uh, look, I think the argument that Gase is going to make to Ross is look what I did with Tannehill. Then he got hurt. Okay? Yeah. And so everything got derailed. He came back. He wasn't really right. Okay? We had a bunch of injuries. I Give tried me, with Cutler. I tried with Cutler. Give me another chance. Okay? Give me another chance to draft a quarterback. So I know I didn't take it at all. And I also thought it was, and you know my feelings on this, but I thought it was frustration at the particular reporter is, mm-hmm. is the sure. reason that Gase reacted the way he reacted. But So I think it was about Gase. I think he took it as an indictment of himself because otherwise, frankly, I found it kind of stupid that we were even having this conversation about whether Ryan Tannehill is good enough this week. Ryan Tannehill is not physically capable of playing right now. <laughs> Why are we even talking? Why was that even a question? I don't understand. I mean, what is the... What is the story there? Like, Ryan Tannehill was not suiting up this week. He's, as we've said repeatedly, likely not suiting up next week. So why does mm-hmm. it matter if he's good enough at this point? The only question is, when is he playing again? And if not, why? Like, So I, I took that whole interaction as Gase. Ass covering. Ass covering for Gase. Yeah. Okay? Yes, he got better. I'm the coach. 
He got better. Mm -hmm. He got better under my watch. He was on his way to being better, better. if not for the injury. This shit ain't my fault. Mm -hmm. Okay? And there's also the issue, and I think CK is going to get more into this on his pod, so I'll let him do it. But but there's a little bit of a dispute um, in terms of the way they're treating this injury, too. And I think that stuff's going to come out. Uh, Ryan has very um, different views of recovery than maybe a team would. And, and you notice that Tannehill's still tweeting out the stuff about sort of those homeopathic um, oh, methods. interesting. And he's, so he's not as interested in modern medicine. I, I think that's something that people should watch. Let's just lay, I'm going to okay. leave it to CK to get into that more for his pod for Tuesday. So overall thought is you think he's going to play again this year. I don't. I don't have a mm -hmm. strong lean on that, yeah. um, but I don't. All right, let's get to number five here. Uh, I don't even know that we're going to bother with the Canes this week. I hate to do that, but it's just, <laughs> I, it's yeah, just, it's it, just so depressing. They, they can't score. They uh, can't move the ball. I, I mean, the end. The end. I yeah. mean, they, they're, they're now – Five and seven in their last twelve. Yeah, um, the most impressive win of those five is a one point come from behind win against a historically bad FSU. It's team. probably at Toledo, like winning by three scores at Toledo, which again, right. a middle of the road Mac. Middle team. of the road Mac team. Okay, they, yeah. their other wins are against Savannah State. What the and hell FAA. happened? I, I what I, happened? We'll have time for that. I, 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 we might have to. I, I was talking with Manny Navarro about this in the in the uh, Miami Heat press room. He was covering a game that that I was at against Sacramento. And it was just like, what? What the hell? Like, and well, and you look at and you look at the advanced stats on their defense. Uh, SB Nation has this great S and P Plus stat. They're top fifteen on defense. No, but no, like, Man, but like, Man but like, Diaz is going to be a head coach. The, the, yeah. the, wor the worst part about this for the Canes, yeah. is that it's expediting Manny's departure. Is I think it? The, is I, it I, like I, like? Do you do you think someone is looking at? The five and four Miami Hurricanes for their next head coach. I, I, I almost wonder if the teams, the teams' no. lack of success people might help know. there. People are smart yeah. enough. They know. They, they what, know. What, they know do, what do, you think, do you think he'll take like an FIU job? Not that the FIU uh, will be, be available, but no, do you think I, like a, I, I like think, a power five school is coming for him? I think he can get a higher level job than that. I really do. Yeah. I, I, he created. I, I think now it's looking even more impressive because I think there are some schools that may mm -hmm. look at it and be like, "Look at what he's done with that defense to maintain yeah. that defense." Under the adversity of having horrible play calling and terrible quarterback play, yeah, like I, I like uh, to me, I, I to G me that's, they gave up. They gave up twenty against uh, against Duke. They gave up nineteen against UVA and twenty seven against BC. They're bad for a couple of possessions, but one of those was off a pin or, an interception inside the twenty. Yeah, look, like, I, yeah, I, I, their I defense think, is amazing. I think this. They can't punt. The, the punting is just. I, punt I was I was watching Matt Hawk today, like drooling, <laughs> like oh my god, that's what this is supposed. That's what punting is supposed well, to look like. Maybe Gase is the punt whisperer. <laughs> Hunter whisper. <laughs> I don't know. I, I will. I will say this: the best coach on this staff, this Dolphin staff, yeah. is Darren Rizzi. Yeah, the best coach on this staff. We talk about Chris Greer survive, surviving amongst coaching staffs and and, and franchise changes. Rizzi's the other one too. Riz, Rizzi finds a kicker every year. Yeah, and the punting's been good. Uh, Grant has been good as a returner. Darren Rizzi saves the, the Dolphins. Teams have been great. Darren Rizzi saves the Dolphins' money. The Bears paid a lot of money for Cody Parkey. Right, and and Rizzi's like, yeah, don't worry about it. I'll find another Jason one. And he Sanders, did. Jason and he Sanders did. has been fine. The, the field goal, the, the first one that he made, he could have made it from like seventy yards. Yeah, no, he's been uh, Rizzi is the best coach on this staff right now. I, I don't yeah. think there's any question about that. All right, so let's let's uh, fi finalize here uh, again. Mm -hmm. We can talk about the Canes another time, but yeah. it's going to be hard to. I, I don't even know that they're a bowl team at this stage. Um, they've got they've got three chances away to Georgia. Tech, away to Virginia Tech, and home with Pitt. It might come down to the final day. It Again, might be a five and six game against Pitt and, and, that you have and, to win at home. And Pitt is where this all started last year. Right, exactly. Um, with, with all the problems that they've had. All right, but let's get to part five here, which is, look, for all the negativity about the offense and everything else, the Dolphins are five and four. Yep. Um, we're watching right now. Seattle is uh, losing to San Diego. Los now, Angeles. Uh, Los, uh, I'm going to call them San Diego. <laughs> L.A. doesn't know they're there. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. that, that is very okay. true. L.A. doesn't know they're there. Um, so th we're expecting a Charger win. If that's not the case, you can bang on us tomorrow, but we're taping this as we go. So basically the way this plays out for the Dolphins is this. Um, they're obviously not going to win their division. They have There are two wild card spots. The AFC North appears that it's going to get one of those wild card spots. And the Dolphins have already mm -hmm. lost to the Bengals. Um, and so you have the Bengals and the Steelers. The Steelers won today, which pushed the Ravens back a little bit. Yeah. But the Steelers or Bengals, whoever does not win the division, is likely to get the wild card spot. Yeah, the, the Bengals were off this week. 
then they're uh, home with the Saints, at the Ravens, home with the Browns, home with Denver. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess the only hope for the Dolphins is that those North teams beat each other, right? And I, I don't think Los Angeles is falling off. I think they're getting in, even even if they lose today to Seattle. They have they have a soft enough schedule. I, I looked it up recently. Mm-hmm. Like their 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 schedule is soft enough. So I guess it really is dependent on one of those two teams. And the Dolphins winning a road game. Like they're they're, right. they're home with the Jags, which looks a lot easier than it would have at the start of the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're home with Buffalo. Uh, like they'll they've got some opportunities left to win some games at home, but they've got to they've got to obviously be Buffalo away. Yes. But then win another one of these games that doesn't look very winnable at the moment. Like the ceiling is eight wins, nine wins. Like I don't think that's enough. Yeah. Well, I, nine is what they would need for sure, which means you you've got to win four out of the last seven. So where would and I don't know that that'll be mm-hmm. enough because like you said, if, sure. if if you're if you're looking at the second place North team. Team, and you're looking at the Chargers, and you've already lost to the Bengals, okay? Um, and they still, and so uh, to me, you need at least nine. You probably need, you need ten. So your home, so the home games left are Buffalo, New England, and Jacksonville. They've beaten New England here before, but you can't rely on that. You can't, but it's it's also the other problem is it's not quite late enough in the season. If it was yeah. week 16 or 17 instead of 14, oh, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. then you might have Belichick. Like New like that might be the game. Guys. That might be the game that establishes that they win the division. Right. Right, like that like they secure it on that day. So I guess so if if we're presuming a home win against Buffalo and home win against Jacksonville and again that defense might, you know, ruin ruin the day for this Dolphins offense, but you have to win at Buffalo. You'd have to win probably in Indianapolis yes. if, if you're going to make the playoffs. And Minnesota looks increasingly like a game you could win. Again, you'll probably be a seven or eight point favorite. They they won comfortably today at home against the Lions. So uh, I I I just think that from a like the Dolphins are still proceeding forward as if this season's about making the playoffs. And I, it's just crazy to me that first they're even in that position. Mm-hmm. Like and, th- and that's the thing for me about the Adam Gase era is we talked a lot about his uh, his coaching, but the first season. Was an over was it was an exceeding of expectation because I don't think anyone expected them to go ten mm-hmm. wins. I think last year with Cutler, like I think you talk about point differential and all that, that looks like a three and thirteen team on paper with Cutler a quarterback. Yeah, but but six wins okay, and I'd say five and four is kind of like what, what we said seven and nine for them ahead of the year. Like five and four for me is. It's okay, like from a record standpoint. Right. Again, underlying performances, but why is the record? As long as you don't have to watch them. Right, exactly. I, but like, I, but why? I, but why is the record this good? I guess would be my question. Well, I, I think. I mean, you have to break down the individual games. I mean, yeah. the, the Bears game was a missed kick. Uh, this, but also, I mean, scored thirty-one points with you know okay. with their with, with a surprise quarterback. It was still a missed kick, right? Okay. Yeah. T- today, you know, Darnold threw the ball three times directly Correct. at at yep. uh, at J- Dolphins defenders. Uh, the the you're better in all faces for me in the Titans game. Yes, uh, you were better on defense in the Jets game. Right. And what what's what's the last one that we were? I'll, I'll, I have the schedule in front. And then the Oakland game. The Oakland game was weird. The Oakland game they probably should have lost, but I guess play calling probably won you the game because it's the Jakeem touchdown and the and the Albert Wilson touchdown that's that secure you that victory. And then a late Xavier Howard interception. But like it's probably probably the play calling and the the creativity. That won you that one. But, like, these are kind of all one-offs, right? You still don't really have a, like, okay, so let me ask you a question. On a scale of mm-hmm. 1 to 10, how good is the Dolph- How good are the Dolphins? They're a 4. Yeah. They're, they're a 4. They're, they're not, and, and this is the problem, is that they're a 4 that probably by some fortunate circumstances might end up 8 and 8. Which would be good because I'll win my my bet at BetTSI because <laughs> I, I had them over six and a half. I, I lost my Canes bet a long time ago. I had uh, them over nine and a half. Well, may, maybe you should have done that over two seasons. <laughs> but but uh, but 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 the bigger issue is to me is and uh, you know again not to talk heat here but I mean they're just going to be stuck in the middle again. Yeah, they're going to be there. It's the worst of all worlds because they're they're going to be stuck in the middle again. They're not going to get a high enough pick to fix it. They did not address their quarterback situation in a year where there were a lot of quarterbacks that they could address it with. Yep. Uh, so they're, they're not going to be in a position to get the one or two quarterbacks who might be worth it in this draft. And I, I don't think, because they, they have a clean slate in the offseason in terms of getting off some contracts. It's basically only Rashad Jones and Tannehill at the, that, that are, you know, contracts you can't get off of. They've got a clean slate to totally reshape this roster. And I guess my question would be is, do you think you can get to 3-13 and 13 for Tua Tungavailoa? Like, like is, 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 can 2019 be the disaster okay. season that the, this team needs? The Dolphins are never disastrous enough in the right year. Right. 
That, that's why, like, that's why, not... if, if they're going to be disastrous this year, it would have been a disaster because, like, everyone's talking themselves into Justin Herbert of Oregon, right? Who's probably not that good. Like, like, can they be bad enough in a year when Tua will be the number one pick? Well, if I mean enough throws on third and one, I think it's really possible. <laughs> That's your I, that, that, I, throwing on third and one is and 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 uh, and, oh, and drives, opening drives is your corner. I don't want to be right right about this every week. <laughs> I, I just I don't. But I, uh, it's it's we, I, you know what's funny is that because I, I come off the pregame show, and so usually like the first the first two series of the first quarter and the first two series of the third quarter are are, are when are like I'm most out of it. Because I just talk for three and a half mm-hmm. hours and I'm tired and I don't want to think about it. And then after halftime, halftime is such a frenetic experience too. But um, I usually like I kind of wind down. Whereas like I just imagine you sitting over in your seat, right? Opening drive begins. Let's oh, see had, what happens this week. I had the tweet lined up. <laughs> I had it lined up. <laughs> it was I, your uh, you, you know what I should have done next next week instead you, of putting in the drafts. I'm literally going to go to TweetDeck where you can schedule the tweet. <laughs> no, you should just tweet it before the drive even happens. I, I'm gonna and just just, re- just retweet yeah. yourself after they don't score. Well, that, that's like what Mark Hockman said. We we predicted the Taylor. And the, I just did it again. We predicted that you had the Dolphins cornerback being a former we, Marlins reliever, Taylor Tankersley. Uh, yeah, we, we, <laughs> we predicted the Cordray Tankersley injury before the season even started. No, we didn't. But anyway, all right, so that's uh, that's our episode for today. We didn't really figure out the Dolphins very well. I, I guess you know the end game here is that we're going to end up probably in the middle at the end of the season. Yeah, and I think, I think, it, they, I think it's 8-8 now. I think it's 8-8, eight and, eight, and I think we're going to look at it and say, okay, are they good, are they not good? Is Adam Gase, is he good, is he not good? And I, I just don't think any pro- – I, I think we're going to look at this entire season, and it's going to be a total wash. Just because, like last year was. Right. That's two years in a row. Two years in a row. That no quarterback was developed, that we didn't really learn enough about, that they added Minka Fitzpatrick, that's good. But for the most part – You didn't really, really learn, like, okay, learn anything important. That, like they've got strengths in these areas. Like they're really good nah. at pass rush. They're really good at pass blocking. They're really good at running the ball. Like – what are they really good at? Well, I, and I think, again, this cuts across all our sports down here right now because I think we just had a total lost season with the Hurricanes, and I think we're on the verge of a lost season with the Heat where yep. really nothing is going to be gained or learned at or least, anything. At least the Marlins, you can say they're building towards something. Right. At least you can say, all right, if this pans out, if all these prospects that they're going to draft and if Victor Victor works out, if all these guys that they're rebuilding around, in two years' time they'll have a decent team. Right. It feels like everybody else is building towards nothing. Right. It's just it's sort of going nowhere. And, and with that, listen to all the podcasts that they've had <laughs> in the Five Reasons Sports Network where we can talk. We're like the Seinfeld of podcast networks. It's just like a podcast network about nothing. <laughs> um, anyway, we'll have other episodes this week. We're going to be at this ping pong tournament uh, for the Jason Taylor Foundation, so we'll do some interviews there. Also, we're going to do some NBA this week. We're going to have John Kaczynski. Did I say that correctly? No, you didn't. You, I, did. you forgot the R. I'm sorry. Krasinski uh, <laughs> from The Athletic to talk about the Jimmy Butler situation. We're also going to have Tom Haberstroh. You know, I've got I've got Krasinski and Haberstroh on the same yeah. episode. Two names that I cannot pronounce. And one that uh, with Haberstroh at Heat Media Day, Giancarlo Navas never got there. Like it's not even. I'm going to try and sound it out. We're going to have a little fun, and then I'll eventually. Oh, Haberstroh! Like just never, yeah, got, never there. got there. Never got there. And I won't get there either. But check out the <laughs> other podcasts in our network, and we'll talk to you soon. <laughs>